So this is lecture five in the Western peace traditions. So I'm going to linger on the Beatitudes, which is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be using my book, Mountain Meets Valley and the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes in many ways is the ethical foundational sort of Magna Carta of Western ethical thought as it's applied to peacekeeping, peacemaking. And so important to understand just as the Roman tradition was grappling with just justice and just war theory and the Hebrew tradition was trying to make sense of shalom and the role of the prophets versus nationalism with Jesus's teaching in the Beatitudes and then Sermon on the Mount which we get in Matthew 5 to 7 the foundation is laid for what it means to be a genuine peacekeeper those whose souls are formed internally and then what that looks like externally in terms of politics. Many Christian communities have drawn very heavily from historically from the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount. As I mentioned, it is probably the most important formation text of people's character and souls and how a person lives and knows themselves on a meaningful level. And so what I'm going to touch on briefly today is the first part of the Beatitudes in which Jesus takes the disciples, those who are close to him, to a mountain. Here you get great mythic tendencies. So you leave the valley far from the matting crowd and go to the mountain. Whenever there's a, a, a scene, a narrative in any text of valley mountain there's a sense that people are going somewhere to be taught something that can't be properly understood or internalized in the hurly-burly of valley life itself but it also has to be internalized in a way that a person when they return to the valley itself uh, can be imperfectly thought and lived through so the Beatitudes, which is really the first part of the much larger Sermon on the Mount, as I mentioned, from Matthew 5 to 7, there's a shorter version of it in the book of Luke, but it's not as developed. And so groups within Christianity, and of course, how did Jesus, when he was opposed, similar to Socrates in some ways, did he respond with violence? Did he respond with anger? Did he respond vindictively? And so what you have in the early Christian tradition is Jesus models a way of dealing with conflict in a non-violent manner. He, a variety of times he's offered the possibility of using violence, given the way he's being about to be treated violently and the way he's misunderstood, the way he and the disciples are often marginalized, caricatured, <clears throat> misread. Uh, does he respond in anger, vindictiveness, rhetoric, turning on people with uh, cannons fully loaded? No, that's not the mark of a good peacemaker in any way. So if a person wants to be a doctor, for example, what's the training they have to go through in terms of learning the skills to be a doctor? If a person wants to be a dentist, what is the the skills, what's the training they have to live through? If a person wants to be an electrician, there's a certain process by which facts are learned that at the end of the day they're an electrician. Well, if one wants to be an authentic or a genuine peacekeeper, then what's the training what are the skills that have to be learned to be that? Not just external peacemaker, but also a person, of course, can be and live in a world in which there's seeming peace in a political external world, yet very, very much at odds internally with themselves, at war within. So the, the peacekeeping that Jesus is talking about deals both with the inner life. We'll find the same thing, for example, in Tolstoy's great work, War and Peace. And so there's the external war of Napoleon invading Russia, but there's also the variety of protagonists and antagonists in this great epic novel that are very much at war uh, between one another, both within them, within themselves also. So in Jesus, when we deal with the with the Beatitudes, he's very concerned with uh, articulating in a very clear, compact, aphoristic way some of the landmarks or the map for being a peacekeeper and the trail to walk that leads to that. So the Beatitude starts with um, seeing the crowd. So Jesus, first of all, then, as I said, takes 
those who are closest, nearest, and dearest to him, those he thinks are ready to hear. And of course, within any philosophical, theological character formation, story, educative, there are certain people not ready to hear certain things. And you'll get constantly in Jesus' teaching that if they're not ready to hear, then you just don't say certain things. And it doesn't take long when you get to know people that their soul is not properly oriented. Their ears, the ears of their soul, are not listening. So there's certain things you don't tell them. It's what's called the it's what's called the principle of reservation in philosophy uh, in which you reserve saying things to people and then you accommodate it's also the principle of accommodation accommodating where people are at on their journey and so knowing what to be said why not so the beatitudes begins then with only choosing those he thinks are imperfectly ready to hear what it means to be a peacekeeper or peer. there is the hunger there is the longing it starts off with seeing the crowds and already you get a distinction between the crowds who really are just following Jesus for sensational issues, for miracles, for titillation, uh, but they're really not interested in, uh, in more deeply understanding what it means to live a substantive, a wise life in that sense. So already with the beginning of the Beatitudes, you get this seeing the crowd. Seeing is an interesting Greek word here. You can see a person empirically, you can see their physical features, but that doesn't mean a person sees into their soul or what they're prepared or ready for. This Greek word is seeing into the souls of the crowd, the oculos, uh, the, he, calls, he calls his disciples to them. And so what you get here is the disciples then leave the valley and you go to the mountain ridge. You go a little higher. Obviously, these are not Rockies we're talking about in Palestine. They're really just little knobs of rock hill. But it, it moves you away from the hurly-burly of the valley uh, to a place where it's quiet still. And people have to slow down. Uh, pace has to go at a much more moderate place. The ears of their soul have to be much more attuned to what's going to be said and so just bring the text here for you so it says um, and so seeing the crowds it says um, he went to the mount interesting mountain here oros in greek it's um ice ice to oros oros is from which we get the word oracle and so oracle has always mountains and oracle have always been those places in which wisdom and insight comes through and so Jesus then takes them to the place of the oracle or the mountain or the place of insight where they're prepared to hear. And it says, and then he, uh, and then he seats himself. When I was doing philosophy in undergraduate studies, we went off to particularly had classes outside. We'd follow our, our teacher. And, but when he would sit, uh, we knew that something more important was going to be say, said rather than just talking about what Plato or Aristotle thought or Augustine or Aquinas or Marx, or any of these thinkers. So the word here for sitting in Greek is we get our word catharsis. And actually, in the Roman Catholic tradition, when the Pope speaks, he speaks ex cathedra. So the teacher, you get the sense, you get oracle, you get catharsis. The teacher has to be clean inside. There's no crooked lines within them. And so the when Jesus seats himself, it's not only a seating, but what he's about to say, there's a level of cleanliness, of truth to it, which will go deep into the followers' souls. And so he seats himself and then he calls. Now again, just as he takes certain people up to the mountain, uh, certain parts of them are called forth. Um, there's, as Whitman would say, I contain multitudes, but what part of the multitude within a person uh, is being called forth that is meant to live in a more meaningful and substantive way? So Jesus calls that part of them forth that is the deepest part of them of which they then can listen in terms of what is going to say. So he calls uh, these disciples, it's called the Mathete, or those who are ready uh, to him. And so, and then it says he opens his mouth. And there's another interesting Greek word. There's people open their mouths and they say nothing, essentially. They just blather away and nothing of substance. So this is a Greek word in which the opening of the mouth is the opening of the soul or the opening of the heart or the opening of the mind to speak eternal truths uh, that are not transitory, but in fact will stay with a person on their journey. So he opens his mouth and this is where he begins. And this is really the bit of the preload. He opens the mouth of his and he begins to teach, teach, um, teach them 
saying. And so the, the preamble to the Beatitudes itself sets the stage for then what is about to come. So it's a bit like someone interesting wanting to become a lawyer, a doctor, a dentist, or an electrician. There's a bit of a, a preamble, a preparation. You send out a course outline. You set out what the courses are going to look like, the time frame to finish. Uh, so this preamble sets people up and prepares them prepares them very very much for what is about to come in terms of being a peacemaker. I could linger with this preamble itself if I wanted to parse and dissect each of these words but we just want to move along in the Beatitudes uh, a little quicker pace but each aphorism which I'll get to in the next a couple of weeks lays the foundation or the conditions of what it means to be a, a just peacemaker uh, in that sense. So that I'm going to move a little over now in terms of the um, uh, in terms of this Western peace tradition to the Pauline Johnson's legends of Vancouver called Deep, Deep Waters. I might also add anyone who tries to embody the Beatitudes, Jesus makes it very clear at the end of it, they will be mistreated, they will be caricatured, they will be persecuted, they will be tripped treated as he says that the prophets is old yeah he knows how he was about to be treated and so the story here from deep waters from pauline johnson it's a story of conflict again because peace always finds its way in the midst of conflict and how it's overcome in deep waters it's really the story of the clash between in this case the capilano and nature so nature and people colliding in that sense. It's a flood story. Most condition, most civilizations and cultures have their own flood stories. The, and Pauline Johnson in this particular thing talks about, initially she's from an Iroquois background, talks about in her own tradition, animals often bear much more wisdom than humans. And she recounts some of the various animals that are a part of their flood story, but they have far more wisdom than humans and anyone who studies First Nations mythology in that sense. Many of the different animals are totems or icons in that sense into wisdom and into insight. But Pauline Johnson, after talking about her own Iroquois background in terms of the animals, humans, conflict between them, this story, Deep Waters, is in fact about a, a deep waters, literally and metaphorically. It's a flood story of the Capilano before time, before, before contact. And so a flood, a flood comes and the waters rise bit by bit. And of course, it's taking the story is told really outside of the Narrows and Stanley Park area. Uh, the waters rise, they rise more and more, and the leaders of the Capilano uh, tribe realize if the rains keep falling and the waters keep rising, everyone is going to drown. So a decision is made that in fact the elders and the older people uh, have to somehow protect the tribe as it moves on, as nature is ravaging and destroying their own uh, people. So they decide that the women will make this long, long cord. The men will build a huge, huge canoe. And so they will work together uh, to preserve the future. And as the waters rise, they'll only put the youngest children in and the youngest woman who's recently born a children and the youngest man uh, who's inching towards adult age. And so as the conflict ensues between nature and humans, the band has, the capital band has to work together as they move into the future itself. And so each and all are willing to sacrifice themselves for the common good and the future of their bands. The waters continue to rise, but they built this huge canoe. They've got all the small children finally in it. And as I mentioned, a young woman who's just had a child who will be the future and a young uh, a young boy who will part, be part of that. And so the as the waters rise and rise and all the mid-aged older people drown eventually, the canoe, the huge large canoe protects all the children. And as the water subsides bit by bit, it's tethered because of the finely woven rope that the women made and the water begins to go down and they begin to look over from the heights of high mountains on the North Shore. And they see, of course, the towering mountain above all is Mount Baker. And they see that it's 
clothed and dressed in white and they know the waters are beginning to recede so they unhook the rope they paddle over to Baker and so from Mount Baker as the water recedes gradually land appears again and there is this myth if anyone who climbs Mount Baker when the crevices are open you may still to this day find the great canoe of the flood season in which the Capilonum band. The key thing to note here, conflict between nature and humans, and yet in the tension behind between how the Capilano band will survive, they're willing to work together. People sacrifice themselves for the greater good of the future, and out of that the Capilano tribe emerges. And so Peacemaking also has a lot to do with, in this particular story called Deep Waters, um, what drowns, what has to die for others to live and for the future of both First Nations and nature to work together harmoniously into the future at the end of such a catastrophe.